Come on, I'm in route right now. You need to hurry. Get kids on that bus. Bravo 2 and move it out. Ruhe jetzt, ihr Gören. Es wird bald alles vorbei sein. Mom, Bravo 2 on. Line up the shot. Nein, nein, er sollte noch gar nicht hier sein. He's got a hostage. Bravo 2 on, go ahead. Ich vorbereite. Es muss funktionieren. Mom, Bravo 2 on. We lost sight of him. <lacht> ich verschließe die Türen, sodass du nie in diesen Bus kommen wirst. He's locked the bus. So sollte ich genug Zeit gewinnen. Oh, I need to find another way in. Verdammt. Was macht er denn jetzt? Jeremy, time's up. Ich werde all meine Macht nutzen, um den Platz zu wechseln, kurz bevor er abdrückt. Ja, ja, das ist wunderbar. No, Ron, don't bloody do it. Er wird es nicht kommen sehen. Was? Wie konnte er das voraussehen? MP5 that drank raw milk. Micah, would you consider this a rifle or a submachine gun? It's definitely confused. Actually, HK would consider it a submachine gun. In many ways, I consider the HK-53 to be one of the more interesting designs in the fact that it's not particularly well known. However, it has been used in many conflict areas throughout the world. So today, we'll be discussing this very interesting rifle, as we always do on Grand Thumb, from both a shooter's perspective as well as from a historical perspective in mechanical perspective. Today on Grand Thumb, the Thick P5. But before we get into that, we of course have to thank the biggest sponsor of the channel, which is the Sonoran Desert Institute. No Charles, I think, to screw me up. If you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing, they are the people to go to. We love them, they support the channel, and we cannot thank them enough. So Micah, who can we not forget? Primary arms and uh, I don't have any. I don't have any way to assimilate the uh, thick B5. And That's arms. okay. Primary arms makes awesome optics at a great price. They're actually made where? Where are they made? In that mountain. Yeah. Under the mountain, right there. Go and check them out. We love them. They sell everything you possibly need. And of course, if you're looking to get better at shooting, dry fire is the way to go. Mantis will turn your weapon into a dry fire machine. So go give them some love. AAC, of course, is our ammo sponsor. Um, we're using all 77 grain. <laughs> Sear so Match Kings on this guy right here, which makes it a accurate submachine gun. <laughs> so with all that being said, talk is very cheap, but making Micah keep his pronouns on his bio because he loses at, uh, you know, drills is priceless. So let's continue. But what is the HK-53 exactly? Because it might be a little confusing looking at it. So the best way to describe it is the G3, the MP5, the HK-33, the HK-53, they're basically literally all the same mechanism. It's just from small MP5 to really big MP5 being the G3. So MP5 being nine millimeter, the HK-53 being 5.56, and the G3 being a 308. They're all just slightly larger than one another. The 5.56 in many ways is kind of forgotten. All of these weapons operate on the roller delayed principle, which is very interesting. We'll talk about that during the talking portion of the shooting. Other than to say that it requires very few moving parts and 
is an incredibly reliable system of operation. But more on that later. For now, we're going to get into the shooting, and then we'll talk about some of the history and shootability of the weapon. Mike, are you ready? I'm stoked. Okay, we are starting the drill portion. <laughs> starting the drill portion with the HK-53. Now this particular HK-53 has safe semi, really, really fast semi. So Micah, first drill is going to be one full mag. Who can get it? The my <laughs> absolute my favorite. tightest. Uh, we'll start at seven yards right here. And uh, I guess kind of a shot timer, kind of not. But uh, we'll go ahead and we'll, I guess we have to do that next lap. All right. All right, shooter ready. Yeah. Stand by. You know, I don't know why we're timing, but yeah, that doesn't, it doesn't make any, a lot of sense. Crazy. Look at that. Nice That's and... pretty good. Okay, we'll uh, put this to the side. You'll get your own target. All right, Mike's been shooting it all day. I'm going to shoot it for the first time today. Let's... All right, I'm going to pull the trigger as fast as I can. Really fast trigger. Jeez. I got a lot of respect for yours now. I like how you, uh, my favorite part is you kind of made like a circle right here. It all happened at once mm -hmm. as you're shooting. It was cool. You might notice a really large group here, a really large group here, and then kind of a long circle we here. We have to give you respect in the fact that you haven't been shooting this though. Yeah, I shoot a lot of MP5s and this is not that. <laughs> you you want to give it one more shot? Kinda. One more shot, yeah. okay. Okay, okay round two, if your group isn't any better, then pronouns for another month. All right, I'm just gonna like ultra stance this. And if you do better, I'll buy that, uh, the uh, 308 HK in this size. Really? Yeah. Beep! God. Yes! Oh. Yes! Oh. Yes! Chat, does this count? Chat, <laughs> chat, is this real? That counts. Yeah, that's a line break. You're good. Good job, dude. <laughs> we'll get that three away. Two chests, one head. All right, two chests, one head. Uh, Shooter ready. Started in low ready, high ready. Oh, low ready. Okay. Shooter ready. Yeah. Stand by. Oh, I air -balled, airballed it. Airballed. Oh, airballed. Dude. You just wanted to be like Mike. Uh... <laughs> Shooter, are you ready? Yep. Stand by. Airball! <laughs> okay, redo, redo, redo. <laughs> Hold on. I airballed it again. Dude. <laughs> dude. 0.99 though. <laughs> oh, hide over board. 109. I mean, it's better than me, dude. I didn't even hit him. I guess we just suck. So guys, one thing that we do want to talk about right here is the 53 has like an eight inch plus some change barrel. The ranch hand will know something about that. And because of that, the 5.56 round is traveling very, very slow. Okay, first thing we're gonna shoot right here is an 11.5 URGI. 11.5 uh, has great bullet velocity. So, okay, next up we have the HK-53 with a eight inch and change barrel. Let's show you the actual velocity right here. It's probably going to be uh, quite slow. Look at my impact area. Come on. <laughs> no way. It's so, so slow. It's 77 grain traveling 2090. I mean, compared to like an MP5, like that'd be awesome. But, uh, you know, your 5.56 is going to have a few issues. Okay, before we get into the talking portion, we're going to do a quick comparison on really, really fast semi automatic. So we have about as short as you can go on an AR, which is 10.3. You can go shorter, but don't. And then we have the HK-53, which is an aid and change barrel. So we'll fire both of these and we'll talk about the controllability. We'll start with the HK-53. Mikey, you ready? Good to go. My, my groups are getting pretty good with that. Oh wow, not bad. Let's compare that to the Mark 18-ish. Uh, there's already some shots on that target. Uh, yeah. That didn't move. This is so much more <laughs> controllable comparatively. Uh, and the group was a little bit worse, but uh, that was all me. That was 100% more controllable. So, no matter what, there's not gonna be a free lunch with everything. The going as short as you do on an HK-53, you get a very compact package. However, the recoil is definitely very stout. It should be noted that the difference in development between these two rifles, especially for the short M4 variants and the Mark 18 variants is a solid 40 years. So 
the HK53, so the HK53 was definitely ahead of its time, but uh, it is certainly um, obsolescent when it comes to performance compared to modern weapons. Now, this video is brought to you by Aura. So have you ever Googled your name or email and you were shocked to see that your personal information was available to anyone searching? There are companies called data brokers that collect and sell your information to spammers, hackers, anyone who may want to target you. Your name, home address, health records, your relatives, what you buy, it's all out there for anyone to find and buy. Now, there are a lot of people who want this information, from the spammers that call you every day, to companies that are targeting you in social media ad campaigns, to the federal government. That is right, the US government is buying your data to see what website you're visiting, what apps you're using, and more. Show in the boys chat. Which is why I've been a long time user of Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura monitors the web 24-7 to see which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits the request on my behalf to remove me from these lists. Cleaning up my information not only reduces the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this type of information to help them access my social media accounts, hack bank accounts, other sensitive information. Who knows what it is. With Aura, you also get credit monitoring, antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft monitoring and insurance all in a single app at one affordable price i value my privacy you should value yours go to aura.com forward slash grantham and you get a free big trial link right below in the description go check them out get back to the video mike has commented on this multiple times so we have to note uh how did it sound micah i have doubled up ear pro all day after like the first three mags and it still kind of rattles your eardrums we, we were shooting it yesterday and our neighbor over there he's hella far away is super cool and even he was like that thing was loud like the 53 has one hell of a sound signature when you go that short on 556 there's a lot of unburnt powder um just coming out of that barrel and you're getting some freaking noise dude well right here we have the hk53 my bad wrong gun right here we have the hk53 that we've been talking about so much the first thing that i want to do is compare it directly to the mp5 so hopefully you can see both these are these both in frame micah they are awesome <laughs> we have roughly the same size the receiver on the hk53 is slightly longer uh and the stock um, for the 5.56 is slightly longer, but otherwise, and of course we have a different sock on this one, otherwise the weapons are very similar in size. And this is ultimately what made the HK-53 so popular. It was a very popular weapon amongst uh, SWAT teams, counterterrorism units, special operations. So for these guys who are already trained on these weapons, simply switching over to the HK-53 or giving a couple other guys the HK-53 for a little increased firepower, really did not take that much. Now, in the broader context of HK at the time, we'll talk about it for a minute, I'm not forgotten weapons, but at the same time, I do think it's interesting. I do have to give a lot of love over to um, James Williamson, who spent a lot of time talking with me about the HK-53. And of course, this particular weapon was built by Dakota Tactical, who is probably perhaps one of the um, best maker of roller lock guns um, outside of HK. What you have to understand is, you had the G3, which was adopted by the German military, which was a great success for HK. Then you had the MP5, which was developed. Same operating, same operating system as the G3, just a nine millimeter. This thing is an absolute dream to shoot. How great is this, Micah? It's probably one of the best shooting experiences. Probably still the best shooting experience um, of any gun ever, outside of the MP5 SD, which is <laughs> the same gun. So building on that success, in the 60s and 70s, as the America switched over from the 7.62 by 5.1 to the 5.56, HK saw that they probably needed to make a 5.56 gun, hence the HK-33 was made. Michael will pop up a picture right here of the HK-33. It is basically the long 16-ish inch barrel version of the HK-53. Now, that one didn't see as much success as the MP5 or as a G3. Later on, many units wanted a short gun. They are building off a lot of the success that they saw with the AK-74 SU, with how short that was and how um, well it worked for many of the special operation units in the Eastern Bloc countries. HK-53 was then developed and actually saw pretty good success among special operations, more specifically within the United Kingdom. Here's a picture of a bunch of SAS operators running these guns and among many police departments or smaller militaries who aren't who weren't developing their own 556 rifles. So 
the thing about the HK33, the HK53 that we have right here is that ultimately it was a really good gun for the time in the 70s when it came out. However, it was cursed with the fact that when it did come out, other large countries that could have adopted this or would have adopted this were developing their own rifles. The France with the FAMAS, the UK with the SA-80, and of course, um, you know, the FNC from Belgium. So it began to see a lot of competition and a lot of homegrown industries making their own versions of the 5.56 rifles that this gun could have taken over for. So it was just bad luck. And of course the German military at the time was super excited for the G11, which as we know, never happened. And by the time that project fell apart, then polymers began to come into style and we had a completely new series of weapons that were developed. With all of that being said, the HK-53 is still a very good rifle. And what's the most interesting thing to me about the HK-53 is the fact that HK does classify this as a submachine gun. They do that mostly because of the size. It is just a very small weapon and it is classified as such. You've often probably seen in Call of Duty, they would erroneously classify like an AK-74SU as a submachine gun. And you'd be like, you idiots, that's not a submachine gun. But in the context of what the company's called it and in its uh, intended role, it did kind of fit into that niche, even though it doesn't really fit the definition of a submachine gun being a pistol caliber uh, select fire weapon. So with all of that being said, let's go ahead. Let's go down this weapon. Let's talk about it tip to butt. Dakota Tactical did a wonderful job of building this out. So let's go ahead and go down this weapon. Starting here at the muzzle device, um, there are a lot of different muzzle devices that can be chosen from when it comes to the HK family of firearms. The, the most annoying thing is that it's a very weird thread pitch. It's 15 by one right hand. There's not a whole lot of muzzle devices that are fit for that. And this actually brings us to an immediate problem that you have with many roller delayed weapons, which is that unlike short stroke gas piston, long stroke gas piston, the roller delayed system really needs to be tuned for the specific ammo that it is shooting. There is some variability that it can handle, but we're mostly talking about 5.56 and 308. So when you add a suppressor to one of these weapons, that's going to increase the back pressure, of course, even with the flow through cans. This is going to change the timing of the weapon. You actually do need to change the locking piece on these weapons if you're going to be running a suppressor. They need to be tuned for that ammo, otherwise, the time is going to be wrong, or in the worst case, the bolt carrier itself will be traveling so quickly backwards and will hit with such force that eventually you'll begin to get a bulge at the back of the rails right here, which is bad, um, and you begin to have some significant problems with the weapon. So the fact that it does not easily mount suppressors maybe is not the worst thing just due to muzzle device choice. Just understand that if you begin to suppress this or you're going to be running it suppressed, all the time, you should probably begin to experiment with different locking pieces or roller sizes, depending on bulk gap, to make sure that you have it timed correctly. Um, this is older technology. Roller delayed weapons are very durable. It's just there are shortcomings when it comes to it, and it is an older operating principle. Moving from there, we do, of course, have to talk about the handguard. The best part about the handguard is that between these two weapons, it is the exact same handguard size. So handguards that fit the MP5 will also fit the HK-53, which is very handy for um, agencies that already had the Surefire handguards in place or what have you. So you can fit the CACs to it or anything that fits the MP5 handguard is going to fit the HK-53. And it's also very, very easy to swap these out. So we have this pin right here. Simply push the pin out and then you can take that right off and you can technically shoot it without that if you really wanted to. Um, and then you can put on what any furniture, whatever furniture hey, that you we, want. I want to see a full auto mag dump with you holding that. I really don't want to. And of course, on the Surefire handguard, this is one of the older ones. So you can see right there, it's an older incandescent light bulb. It's kind of pathetic. From there, just like the MP5, we do have a ring in order to mount any type of sling mounting hardware. Right here, we do have the Blue Force gear U loop because they're simple and universal and quite quiet. Moving back, we do have the charging handle right here. Now, compared to the MP5, you can see right here on the MP5, there's nothing keeping it locked into place. However, on the HK-53, you can see that there's actually a little tab right here. And Michael will zoom in on that. We'll take some closer video of it. But the reason for that is that way when you are doing CQB work, when you're in your car and you have to bail out this weapon, that you're not going to hit this 
and potentially unlock the bolt where you're gonna have a useless firearm that's going to keep it in place. So if you're going to reload in the HK-53, you have an empty chamber, you're going to pull that, it folds out, pull back, lock it up, and then you can put your full mag in, HK slap that down, and you are loaded. But otherwise, you can just take a full mag and you can go ahead and lock that right into place and that is going to be, it's not so much like the, the MP5 where you shouldn't be locking a full mag into that weapon. That is A-OK -okay when it comes to the HK-53. Uh, when it comes to the barrels, um, HK of course is famous for the cannon steel for their excellent cold hammer forged barrels. Um, in the case of this particular one, we do have the HK barrel in it, but RCM also makes really good cold hammer forged barrels. There are a lot of makers that make good barrels for these weapons. Uh, moving back from there, you do see you do see two tubes. This often confuses people. They think that the um, the series of weapons have like a gas tube. This is not a gas tube. It's merely to actuate the bolt carrier and all of that. So the roller delayed system is think of it like a direct blowback. It's just a bolt there, and what you're doing is you're adding in these rollers that are pressing against an angled locking piece, and they have to overcome that angle from the force of that round firing in order to cycle. So it's delaying that time to unlock. Um, the best thing we could say when it comes to running this type of system, on the G3 at least, if the G3 were to be a direct blowback weapon, this is what I've heard from HK, that the bolt itself, the bolt carrier, would need to be 23 pounds in order to resist the force of that round detonating. So, with, with a roller delayed system, of course, the weight of those um, bolt carriers is ounces. So, you have to understand how effective the roller delayed system is, and of course, many weapons use uh, a similar principle in order to um, delay unlocking, but that's just... It's still cool to know. I think the best way to put it is that there are many operating mechanisms out there in the world, um, from short stroke to long stroke to many others that just never caught on like gas trap. And uh, a lot of them are used very successfully, but the roller delayed system has been around for a long time now. In fact, it was originally developed from the MG42 and um, after World War II ended, the, all those engineers fled to Spain where they did the set me program. And then after everything kind of chilled out in Germany, they came back to work for HK and the G3 was developed, which is a roller delayed weapon. So all that kind of comes back from the MG42. And we have these systems that have been used for a very long time. Uh, you can talk to multiple guys who have served in Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, and there'll be plenty of times they'll tell you they'll kick in a door, shoot a guy, and he'll have a G3, zero bluing left on it, but the thing will still run. The roller delayed system is incredibly robust. Perhaps not as legendary as the long stroke gas piston of the AK, but still, you have to give it a lot of credit for rifles that were made in the 60s still running just as good now as they did back then. Long as it's getting that ammo that it was made for and not running suppressed or something crazy where it's increasing the back pressure, these weapons will run for a very, very long time. Now, there are problems with the roller delayed system. It's heavy. Um, you do need a heavier bolt carrier compared to other operating mechanisms. And because of that, the weight of these guns is much more than what you'd see in other systems. So for example, when the HK-33 was developed, which is the 16 inch variant or 15.8, um, that was a nine pound weapon. Uh, compare that to the M16 that was released around the same time, a little bit before, that was like a seven pound weapon at most. So you could see that you're adding almost two pounds to a weapon um, that's pretty significant over other weapons at the time. Moving from the operating system, well proven throughout time and history, throughout many wars, good, reliable weapon. Um, one thing that I pointed out to Micah, which maybe he doesn't care about, but I think is really cool, um, the roller delayed system does use chamber fluting. So when it fires, you have these gases escaping around the brass. So you can see right here on this, and we'll get a close up of it as well, you can see these characteristic streaks of the carbon scoring on the brass itself. You can see that on the MP5 especially. It's always good to know this type of information when you talk about real world application. It tells you a lot about the individual and the type of weapon that they're using. Um, just something to note. Um, also another thing about the 53 or the 33 or really anything above the nine mil is that they really do dent the brass. So if you're a reloader, this is not the best weapon to use. Uh, not as bad as the FAMAS, but pretty bad. Moving to the magazines. The magazines are proprietary. Um, they are very expensive too, which is a big downside when it comes to the 33 and the 53. So 
when they were originally developed, they were developed as 25 round magazines. So on the original 33s, um, it was safe. And then a number one for single shot and then the number 25 for auto. Um, because at the time, the full mags were 25. Eventually, this was made into 30 because it was a very minimal increase in the length of the magazine. And then, of course, there are longer mags. You see a lot of guys running the 40 rounders as well. Um, that's pretty common on the 33 and the 53. However, I prefer the 30 rounders. They are either steel, like we have right here, or aluminum, which I really don't trust on these guys. It's incredibly, incredibly thin. You just kind of bending a little bit. Do you hear it? No. I don't think I hear that bend in aluminum, no. I do. Unlike an AR-15, there is a little bit of rock to get it to lock into place. So once you kind of get it in, you kind of push back on it, much like an MP5 to get it to lock into place. You have a paddle release at the bottom right here, just like a typical MP5. And if you have monster fingers, you have a magazine release right there on the side that nobody uses unless you're Norwegian or something or, fi or Finnish, I think. For all the lowers when it comes to HK weapons, G3, HK53, MP5, they all swap between all of them. Um, if you want to change between different guns, there's a little bit of modification when it comes to the trigger pack, but otherwise they all work. And um, trigger packs are really easy to put in these guys. Honestly, you don't have a, a tab blocking you in the inside of the receiver, which PTRs, Dakotas, uh, don't. As a quick note just in case you're wondering. Moving back from there, we do have the stock right here. It should be noted the 5.56 specific collapsing stocks are super hard to get. Um, Zenith does release them occasionally. I have high hopes that they'll be releasing more. Otherwise, you're looking to spend way too much money on them. Uh, most guys end up using the fixed stock, which I don't think is as much of a vibe. So unfortunately, we paid way too much for this. Now, at the top here, on this particular build, we do have a welded Picatinny rail on it. Otherwise, it does accept claw mounts. If you don't have the Picatinny rail, we do have an EOTech 512 on there because of, Micah, vibes. Vibes. Yeah, it's a vibe. Thank you. Moving back though, for the iron sights on the HKs are pretty legendary. The front sight is fairly simple. However, the rear sight is a drum that adjusts from 100 all the way up to 400, and it is incredibly precise and easy to use probably among my favorite iron sights of any weapon system to have ever been developed. I do like the uh, the SCAR iron sights, you know why? <laughs> Call of Duty. I was literally gonna say, was it Modern Warfare 2? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, cause he, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, bringing us to a holistic shooter view of the HK-53, um, you saw me and Micah shooting it. It does rock a lot more than more contemporary weapons, but you have to put everything into context. This weapon was developed in the 70s, and in that context, at the time, getting as short as we do right here, pretty incredible. A lot of times you'll hear me say, don't go below 10.3 when it comes to 5.56. We say that because almost everybody has an AR-15, and the AR-15 does not do well below 10.3. It just has many, many issues. This is not true of other types of operating mechanisms. In the case of the roller delayed system, it really doesn't have any problem being shorter down from whether it be 8.3 that we have right here or the K version, which is 5.3, which is really, really short for 5.56. Now, is 5.56 gonna do what it should be doing, going like barely 2,000 feet per second with a 77 grain? Of course not. That being said, you can understand that in a CQB environment, that having maybe one guy with a 53 or the whole team with 53s, you have a significant amount more firepower with the 53 than you do the MP5, but it comes at a cost. The cost is sound. This thing is very, very loud and concussive. And in addition to that, there's a lot of unburnt gunpowder. You have a lot of flash signature coming out of this weapon, which could, um, in t the context of today's wars, be very, very bad for you outside of a very confined CQB type environment. That being said, we do have a very compact weapon that is the size of the MP5. The recoil for being an 8.3 barrel is actually pretty nice. I do like this weapon quite a bit in the context of how it was developed and what it is, but you should understand that it is certainly an obsolescent gun. It's not obsolete, but it is certainly outclassed nowadays. That being said, the HK-53, no matter what, is probably one of the coolest guns because you have an MP5 that took a bunch of trend and now it's chambered in 5.56 and it is just cool looking 
and I love it very much, even though it's not the most practical weapon. And sometimes that cool factor is all that matters. It's okay to have fun. It's still an effective weapon. Here's the point. Train with whatever you have. If you have an HK-53 and you're feeling kind of sad now, that's okay. Go train with it. I'm way more afraid of a guy who's trained more with his HK-53 than a guy with a URGI with an 11.5 who doesn't train at all. Get out there. Get training, guys. That's what matters. Thank you so much for watching. Guys, we have way more great stuff coming. Final thing for you guys is going to be dad advice. Um, the best thing I can say for you guys is your kids are going to grow up fast. And you're going to miss what you miss and you can never get it back. So enjoy that time at the age they're at. Sometimes it can be frustrating. Two-year-olds, how are they, Micah? Oh, my Lord. It can be frustrating sometimes, but you know what? You'll never get those moments back. You'll never get those cuddles back. You'll never get those dumb ways they say words. Enjoy it. Every part of life is a journey. It's not the destination. Guys, thank you so much for watching. See you around.